Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual field day. My name is Dawn Striegel with Prairie Creek Seed. And I'm Kelly with the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. We're so excited to have you with us today. We're going to be having four presentations all down on the farm in Marshall, Minnesota at Jamie Labatt's farm. That's right. Each presentation will have a different focus from soil health to cover crops to grazing to planting green. In the first presentation, we'll be on the field with Jamie and Jen, coordinator of the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition, and we'll focus on soil health. Yep, and if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the Facebook comments section and we can get, uh, do our best to get them down to the fields to get them answered. And thanks again for joining us today and let's head out to the field for our first presentation. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hahn with the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition and I'm your member of Soil Health Coalition and we are out here in Lyon County, Minnesota um, out looking at what he's been working on the last couple of years. And in this segment, we're going to talk about soil and soil health. So let's get a little bit of background on what we're standing in. Jamie, do you want to talk about what this was last year and what you've been uh, doing out this Where year? we're standing now, last year, it was a seven-way diversified cover crop mix that I put in to graze cows on, cow calves on. And uh, some of it I've reseeded this spring. And some of what we're standing in is also coming back from last year, the buckwheat and some sunflowers, some sorghum. Uh, just wanted a diversified mix for the cows to graze on. Excellent. And this has been grazed once this spring already. Okay. And now this is the regrowth, so. Excellent, and you're gonna bring them back in later yep. on this year? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we have a huge uh, diversity of species in here, which is really nice. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna dig it up and we're going to see what we find under all this great veg. So Jamie, have you um, have you been getting a lot of rain this year out here? Not a lot this year. We have been inundated with rain the last two and a half years. Um, I don't have the exact amounts this spring, but probably, I don't know, maybe three to five inches total since since April. So a lot different from the year before. Much different. Yes. <laughs> so what we're seeing, and I'm, I'll bring this up to the camera, we're seeing a lot of great roots in here. We're seeing a lot of good structure. I'll bring, I'll bring this cloud up. There we go. Okay. So we'll break this open and show what we're finding. So this is really nice here at the top. We've got a lot of great roots coming in here and we're getting our structure formed and we're seeing a lot of good soil aggregates and it breaks apart really nicely. And yeah, uh, the last few years, Jamie's gotten a lot, a lot of rain. This year, not quite so much. And it's nice because the soil still has moisture in it. And we're still seeing um, it break apart nicely, even though it, it is kind of on the drier side. So now that we've got this, so this is the soil that's holding on to the roots of this plant. So I'm gonna shake it. It's gonna do a little dance for you this morning. All right, so we still have a lot of it being held on. These roots are doing a really great job of helping to aggregate the soil, provide pores and channels in there to help that water infiltrate. And what we came, what fell in my hand from shaking it are these nice, nice soil clods. So this year and last year, we had it in a diverse cover crop species mix and grazed it uh, to provide these soil benefits as well as benefits to Jamie's operation. Jamie, what was it, what was in this before what was it in uh, 2018 and 17? Is it, it would have been row crops. Generally corn, yep. soybean rotation? Yep. Corn, soybean. Okay. And so these soils are under production agriculture, and we're still able to get this really, really, really nice soil aggregate structure forming here. Um, we've got pores. I don't know if you can see it. There's a really nice pore channel in there. They're doing a great job. Um, helping to improve all of our infiltration. 
Available oxygen. Yeah. So what's one of the most limiting factors uh, for growing crops, especially, you know, in your high moisture areas? Oxygen, that's where we have issues with having disease um, and crop loss. And with all these roots growing in here, once these roots die off and decompose, they're gonna leave these little tiny channels that the water can go through and the next year's roots. And so it'll make it a lot easier for that to happen. And Jamie and I, we were looking at some soils this morning and we found a, a pore lining of a worm in there with some light colored soil in it just a couple inches below the surface. And it was really cool because what that is, it was a worm that came up from below and from down in the, the subsoil and came up to the surface and lined that channel with that subsoil. And so what that is, is like a straw sticking up from the ground and that will allow once the water infiltrates or once the water comes, it'll allow that to infiltrate, go straight through that straw and go down deep so we don't have that water standing. Yeah. And I have noticed in the last couple of years that the infiltration has, has gotten better already. So I'm very happy with those results. Yes. And you can feel when you walk on it, it's not rock hard, it's nice and soft, but it still provides that structure that we need uh, for trafficability, for the livestock. Um, and yeah, so that you can get out here even when it is on the damp side. So, um, if we have any questions, we can go over them right now. Um, otherwise, to get a little more information, um, we do have a video coming up, but I do want to show you a soil clod that has core soil structure, just to kind of give you a, a comparison. So production agriculture. All right, we look at prairie soils, we look at soils and set aside and CRP, and they look beautiful and great. Soils in production agriculture, that's, it's a lot harder to try to get to those pristine soil, you know, uh, systems. And so this is typically what we see in production agriculture where it's kind of a large brick. We're not seeing any pores. It's kind of just what we call, soil scientists we call it massive structure. There's no structure. Um, and so when water comes, there's no channels or anything for the water to get through. And when the roots are trying to get through it, it's very, very difficult. So we have a big difference in what we're seeing out here Oop. with our nice soil structure and our roots and our pore channels coming in. Yeah. So we're making good progress out here. So to learn more coming up, um, I've got a pre-recorded video with a presentation about soils and soil health. I hope you enjoy and thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hahn. I'm the coordinator of the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about soil health or AKA soil quality. So what is soil health? We hear people talking about it all the time. Um, you know, it's becoming more and more used in our vocabulary, but what soil health is, it's just the ability of your soil to function. Soils have five major functions, and that's regulating water, letting water infiltrate, and holding on to that water, um, cycling nutrients, providing physical support so we can drive out there, build buildings on there, support living organisms. And that's not just above ground organisms, that's below ground too. So it's our, it's our plants, plus it's all the soil critters down there. Um, and filter and buffer. So the soils filter and buffer to take the brunt of the chemicals, you know, from our crops growing out there and from our waters. So what happens when we disturb the soil? So anytime we, we go in and we have a disturbance in our soil, we're breaking apart soil aggregates. And what our soil aggregates, you can see a really nice one in that picture. It helps to hold the soil together to reduce erosion through wind and water. It helps support our soils so that they don't seal up once they get saturated. Um, and it lets the, 
the rain and precipitation infiltrate through. Um, it actually releases and burns carbon too, our organic matter when we disturb the soil. Um, and anytime we take something across that, we're breaking off all these pores and channels. So all of our previous roots that we had out in the field, you know, the year before, what those are, they're kind of like straw sticking up from the ground. And what that does, it lets the water infiltrate so it's not sitting on the surface, saturating and drowning out crops. And when we disturb the soil, we're cutting those channels off, we're breaking our, you know, bending our straws so that it doesn't allow that water to infiltrate. It increases compaction um, because once we break that soil structure, those aggregates up, um, we lose the air space and so they, they continue to smash and scrunch together. Um, so we don't have room for air in there, we get compaction. So with all those things, it reduces infiltration. It breaks good fungi in the soil. There's a lot of beneficial fungi in the soil um, and they connect to multiple plants to exponentially expand the rooting area of each plant. And when we disturb the soil, we break them into smaller pieces and then they have to try to regenerate to provide us benefits for our crops. Um, and with that, instead of letting our soil organisms continue to grow and expand to um, increase our crops out there, uh, increase the crops benefit, when we disturb the soil, we're causing them to rebuild. Um, when I talk to students about this, we you know, talk about, well, what happened? What, what would you do if a tornado came through your town? Well, you'd rebuild. Okay, well, what if a tornado came through your town two to three times a year? Well, most of the kids said they wouldn't live there anymore. And that's what it's like for the soil organisms they have to spend all their time rebuilding their homes and their communities. So we're not getting the benefit um, that they do provide our crops with. And it increases that soil crusting and sealing. So you know, you, you go out in the field and you look down and you see it's drying out and it's cracking. Um, and it's just kind of this smooth surface might have a little bit of sand on the top. We don't want that because that does not let the water to infiltrate. And so when it does rain, it'll continue to just sit there, drown out crops, not let oxygen into the system. Um, so we really need to make sure our, our surface soils are open so that we can get that water to infiltrate. And with all those things, it increases erosion potential. And we know that our topsoil is the most valuable soil we have. Um, and it takes a while to build that back. So we, we don't wanna uh, have erosion out there. So talking about erosion, well, we know we don't want erosion, but are there actual costs associated with that? Yes, there are. Um, so an example in Minnesota, our average soil loss for sheet and rail erosion, not gullies, not stream bank erosion, but just regular, you know, uh, sheet and rail erosion is 5.2 tons per acre per year. Uh, for no-till and cover crops, the average erosion rate is a tenth of a ton of an acre per year. A tenth, but a five tons. So if we're looking at losing five tons per acre per year, what does that equate to for nutrients that we're losing? So just nutrients, just nutrients, not even talking about the carbon that we're losing. So for nitrogen, we're losing about 14 and a half pounds per acre per year. Phosphorus, 65 and a half pounds per acre per year. And potassium, about 22 pounds per acre per year, just in that 5.2 ton, 5 tons per acre um, soil loss. What does that mean for, for your pocketbook? Well, losing that many nutrients, that equates to, of course, it depends on the markets, um, but about 45 to $70 per acre per year that we're losing. And that 5.2 tons per acre per year, that gets lost very easily without us noticing. It's very common. So on average, we're losing, you know, around at least $50 per acre per year, just in soil erosion for nutrient loss. So economics and management, um, I worked with farmers around the state um, using PZM, which is Profit Zone Manager. And what we did, we analyzed um, their ground acre per acre on their profitability, return on investment, um, based off of their, their inputs 
and uh, what they get out of it. And so what I found working with the farmers, um, conventional, you know, it costs them total cost of production without land because obviously land costs are very variable. Uh, conventional, it was about 545 an acre. No-till and cover crops, $100 an acre less for inputs. Um, producers statewide using um, thin bin data. The conventional is about 535, so pretty similar to the guys that I was working with. Strip till 480, so we're reducing it there. And with no-till and cover crops, uh, they averaged out at $477 an acre. And then net returns, you know, cost of production, great, but what were the actual net returns? Uh, so the producers I worked with in Profit Zone Manager Conventional, they had a net return of just a little over $5 an acre. The no-till and cover crop guys I worked with, they were over $100 an acre net profit. Now looking in Finbin, uh, producers statewide, conventional, they were losing about $50 an acre, strip till less, the no-till and cover crops, we had a win, we had a positive. We weren't losing money, we were gaining almost $7 an acre. So what about yields? You know, it's scary to take risk and have changes. Um, you know, we want guarantees. We don't wanna have that unknown and come to the end of the year and yeah, not have a good outcome. Um, so again, the guys that I was working with in Profit Zone Manager, uh, the conventional, they were averaging about 195 uh, bushel per acre on corn, no-till cover crops, 196, so not statistically different at all. Producer statewide in Finbin, conventional is at 206, and then no-till cover crops down to 195 and a half, with strip till about 194. Um, and what we've noticed, so average yield increases using cover crops, uh, corn, we're seeing an average of 2% yield increase. Soybeans, about a 4% increase. Um, when we switch that over to doing no-till and cover crops, we do see corn getting a 6% increase in yield and soybeans getting a, about an 8% increase in yield. So fallow syndrome. So some years we have prevent plants. Not fun, um, but you know that's we can't control mother nature. Um, so with fallow syndrome, I mean, we get that with prevent plants, but we also see it when we have, um, you know, we have our row crops growing, which is great. We need to do that. But there's a lot of in-between time where nothing is growing out there. Um, you know, once the, the crops start to senesce all the way until when we have emergence the following spring, you know, nothing is growing out there. So it's like a mini fallow time period, which does affect the soil organisms. Um, why are we concerned about fallow syndrome? Well, we know, you know, we have issues like phosphorus deficiency, it reduces our nutrient cycling and availability, and we see poor stands of weak stunted uh, crops. So what is it about the fallow syndrome that makes this happen? It's the lack of living roots. Um, it's the lack of something living out in the soil in the lack of the mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi in the soil is fantastic. It, it's like a super highway. It attaches to the roots of other plants and it can reach areas that our crops can't reach in the soil to bring them additional food or, well, food. We get, uh, we get more nutrients and water pulling in from the fungi to our plants. And so when we have fallow times out there, we're not feeding the mycorrhizal fungi, and they can actually start dying off, even, <clears throat> even with our regular rotations. And so being able to feed that soil for as long of a period of time throughout the year is very important to help our soil organisms help our, our crops out there. So benefits of soil health practices. I kind of broke the rule for how much information you're supposed to have on a slide. Um, I did not include all the benefits because then you won't be able to read it. Uh, there are so many. Step one, if you want to improve your soils, we need to stop erosion, greatly reduce it because we can't build our soils while we're eroding our soils. 
we're increasing our organic matter, which we know is where the nutrients are. That helps us form aggregate stability. Um, we need we need great topsoil. Um, it increases nutrient cycling cycling efficiency. So instead of using a pound of nitrogen per bushel corn, we are reducing that. We're getting down to eight tenths of a pound, six tenths of a pound. We're not seeing yield reductions. So we're being able to do more with less. Increasing infiltration, so we don't have the ponding. Um, reducing compaction. We're finding pest management benefits to not having to spray for aphids. We're also seeing weed control benefits, especially on water hemp, which has been very tricky. Um, increased trafficability, increased handling extreme you know, temperatures uh, and precipitation events. Um, a lot of great benefits with soil health practices. And it's all about the biology. So I have a picture of a dinner bell in here um, because when plants are growing out in the soil, um, from their roots, they exude these carbohydrates, these sugars. And what that is, is them ringing, ringing the dinner bell saying, hey guys, I'm here, it's time to eat. And so the soil organisms, they, they see that, they, they find out it's happening, and then they come to the plant and they feed on those carbohydrates and sugars. And then what happens, the plant does that because it's smart. It wants all those soil organisms to come because what happens, they eat the carbohydrates, they defecate, and that makes a plant available nutrient. The organisms, they eat each other, defecate, they die. And as they're doing these processes, they are taking the, the nutrients in the soil and converting them into plant available forms. So that's why the plants, they, they utilize energy to call them in and to feed them. If you have a reduced amount of soil organisms in your soil, you know, for many reasons, high disturbance, high chemicals, this and that, um, your plants, they're gonna keep exuding those sugars and calling out saying, hey, you guys, I'm here, where are you? And they're gonna expend a lot of energy and not get a lot in return because we don't have a lot of soil organisms there. And those soil organisms, they're not only important for cycling nutrients and making them plant available, they help decompose the residue so we don't keep piling up more and more residue year after year. Um, it battles pests and disease. You know, if you have a, a robust um, population of soil organisms, when something bad comes in, it's been shown that they can help battle them. And so we have better defense mechanisms for our crops. They help build our soil structure. And so allowing the water to infiltrate, hold on to the water, have that soil structure to reduce compaction um, and help build our organic matter too. So it's, soil biology is kind of like our gut biology. You know, we need a variety out there. Um, without that, you know, our system doesn't work very well. Um, we have symbiotic relationships that benefit our crops. You know, our, our topsoil is actually alive. In one tablespoon of soil, there's more organisms in that than there are people on this earth. That's crazy. That's just crazy, but that's what it is. There's such a variety of them and they all have their own, their own reasons to be there and their own benefits that they provide. And we need to help create that environment for them so that they can be there helping our crops, you know, putting the nutrients into available forms, protecting against pest disease and pressures, breaking down that residue, forming our soil structure. And we've even found where we get the soils going, uh, the biology going, you know, it's been many years in no-till and cover crops. You know, by, by about the 4th of July, we don't have much residue out in the field. Why? Because the soil organisms have already decomposed that and processed it. So we can't keep up with them. We have to keep feeding them, getting them more and more residue out there. Instead of being scared of residue, we're trying to find ways to, to get more of it out there for them. So you can, you can also manage your residue using the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so, you know, you're, especially when you're just getting started, you know, you have high yielding corn, you have a lot of residue out there. 
well, how do you manage that without tillage? Well, the cool thing is using cover crops and your nitrogen or your carbon to nitrogen ratio, you can help break that residue down faster by using cover crops that have a, a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you're looking at your legumes, your brassicas, your broadleaves, they break down a lot faster. And by coupling them with your residue that's out in the field, that helps them break down faster. So microbes, they have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of eight to one, pretty low. Out in the soils, what we're looking for is a carbon to ratio of about 24 to one, because that really maximizes uh, releasing plant available nutrients. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of residue out there, use a high residue cover crop like cereal rye or some kind of grass or grain, and that'll help build that up. If you have too much residue out there, look for those legumes, broadleaves, and brassicas to help break them down faster. And you can play with that with the timing too. Like, when do you want more residue out there? When do you want it to break down? So it provides us a lot of different options. And organic matter, oh, that's what matters is organic matter. It's our carbon, the carbon in our soil. That's what makes things happen. 1% um, of organic matter can provide up to 25 pounds of nitrogen, five and a half pounds of phosphorus and two and a half pounds of sulfur annually that is plant available just by, you know, 1% of organic matter. It can hold 16 and a half thousand gallons of plant available water. So, you know, we get rains in the spring, early summer, the tap shuts off, August, we're feeling dry. We have that organic matter out there to help hold on to that water, help save our plants. And for a three year time frame, we've increased our organic matter by 1% in no till and cover crops on sandy soils in three years. Um, we've also increased organic matter by just a little over half a percent with just straight no-till. And with that, we're increasing infiltration from two and a half inches an hour to about 20 inches an hour with no-till and cover crops. And that helps reduce erosion. We found a reduction in erosion by 26% by increasing um, organic matter. So cover crops. What are they? Um, they're unharvested crops that we put out in the field. Yes, yeah, some of them get harvested by livestock, um, you know, but the majority of the plant doesn't get harvested. And they're reducing erosion, they're breaking compaction, they're opening up that soil so that our precipitation can get through, fixing nitrogen, managing residue, uh, providing weed pressure, feeding our soil organisms, providing forage, um, the list goes on. Again, I, I couldn't fit them all the benefits on the slide. Um, so how do we increase our soil health? There are many tools out there. There's no one right way or wrong way to do it. You need to find ways that fit your management and your timing. That's the key. Um, cover crops, they're excellent. You know, you can put them in any rotation. Reducing tillage, just one less pass provides a benefit. You know, you can work to, you know, reducing tillage, strip till, vertical till to no till. Small grains are excellent for the soil, excellent for protecting, um, you know, from soil erosion. And they have a short enough growing season that allows additional cover crops to be grown out there. Um, you know, there's conversion to pasture land, hayland. There are also um, financial assistance programs locally, state and federally that can help with that. Um, your nutrient management, pest management, and getting livestock out there also really helps ramp up the, the soil biology and the, the increase of your soil health out there a lot faster. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, um, I can be contacted at the email listed on the slide. Good luck out there, and it can be done. Thank you.